Okay, welcome back to History of Psychology. We are now ready to move on to Chapter 11, in which we will focus on uh, evolutionary theory, including and especially Charles Darwin's evolutionary theory, and in particular the influence that it has on uh, mainly early psychology. There are still, of course, some Darwinian influences in modern psychology, but we're going to see that in the, in the early days of psychology, there were also some uh, crucial influences from Darwin's ideas. I had mentioned that uh, we we're talking about evolutionary theory as well. And it's also important to point out that uh, Charles Darwin didn't actually invent the idea of evolution. It didn't begin with him. In fact, it had been discussed and uh, debated for centuries, really. Um, in fact, one of the first theories that we talked about in this class way back in chapter two uh, was actually in part a theory of evolution, though it was a theory that suggested that evolution could not be possible. If you remember, it was Plato. If you recall, Plato said that um, everything in the physical realm of existence is just an imperfect manifestation of some form from the ethereal realm. And so this means then that the forms, so, you know, we were talking about dogs, right? So the, every, every dog that we see uh, is, is an imperfect manifestation of the pure essence of dogness from the ethereal realm. And every uh, zebra is the manifestation of the pure essence of zebraness. And every human being is the, a manifestation of the pure essence of our souls, which are also eternal things. And so from Plato's view, because the ethereal realm is really the primary source of all existence, the eternal forms must therefore be eternal, right? They must always exist and therefore they don't change. Also, this reminds us perhaps a little bit of what Parmenides said about the universe being unchanging. And so if you start to suggest something different, such as the possibilities that species might change and that there is no such uh, idea of a single species representing some sort of perfection or idealized form, then the whole thing goes out the window. And so we can see how, if, as we've previously learned, Platonic thinking became a, a huge influence over a lot of Western thought, especially including Western theology. We can see the, the, the controversy of evolution is really nothing new. It certainly picked up steam in the time of, of Darwin because of the success of his theory in, in actually explaining mechanisms of evolution, but it has historically been um, uh, a controversial idea going as far back as the time of the ancient Greeks. Okay, now let's get back up here to uh, Erasmus Darwin, who is the grandfather of Charles Darwin, and also Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. And they both had evolutionary theories. Both of them are very different than the ideas of Charles Darwin. So as I'm pointing out here, they're arguing for the mutability of species, which means that species are not fixed eternal things, but they're mutable, which means they are changeable. Now Lamarck in, in particular has an idea of how this happens. Now keep in mind Lamarck is working before the, the time of Gregor Mendel and the discovery of genes and, and how inheritance works from Mendel's research is not yet known. So Lamarck concludes that inheritance work works through acquired characteristics. So the idea is that you can acquire a characteristic either through your birth or at some point during your lifespan, you might also acquire new additional characteristics above and beyond what you were born with. And that after you acquire such characteristics, any offspring that you have will also then inherit those, those characteristics. And then those offspring might in fact uh, go above and beyond what they were born with. So here the idea for Lamarck is that evolution is actually a process of building uh, on to what we were born with, right? We are born with a certain inheritance that equips us with certain abilities, but we're able to take those and we're able to improve on them and add to them. As one example, let's imagine um, a situation, let's, let's pick an animal like a cheetah. And what's the, the one thing that really is uh, a characteristic of cheetahs? 
Well, it's obviously, we would think it's their ability to run very fast, right? So we would say that a particular cheetah inherits, inherits its speed uh, from, its, from its parents, and over the course of its lifetime, it will uh, manifest that speed, and it runs fast, but of course, it may also have a chance to build on that. Its speed enables it to, to capture prey, and so it's going to get stronger and bigger, and it grow larger muscles in its legs and improve on its abilities, and actually then, to some extent, um, kind of beat its parents and, and, and add a little bit of speed onto what it was born with. So in this way, this offspring is perhaps, even if it's just a tiny fraction of an amount, is perhaps a little bit better than its parents was. And now, of course, as it has offspring, those offspring inher inherit this, this improvement. And then they, too, can build on it and improve uh, on, on what they were born with and get faster. And now the idea is that over many, many generations, cheetahs are gradually getting faster and faster and faster until we get to the point of where we are now. The idea is that cheetahs are the fastest land animal now because they, uh, they have been gradually improving that ability in the course of their, their evolution. And we might also think, what is the characteristic uh, that defines humanity? And we might point to our intelligence and our brains. And so we'll think, okay, we're, we're born with a particular degree of intelligence acquired from our parents, but we're also able to educate ourselves and therefore build on and improve that intelligence as we go through our education. And then we're going to have children, and then our children will inherit this, this acquired intelligence that we have. And now that they start off with a little bit uh, of, a, of a little step up from where we started off, they're going to improve on that. And then they will have slightly smarter children, and so on and so forth. So for Lamarck, evolution is a gradual process of improvement. Every species is getting better and better at being whatever it is. To an extent, this is almost a, a, a holdover of platonic thinking, because in this case, the idea is that uh, cheetahs are getting better and better at being perfect cheetahs, right? as if they're uh, somehow evolving towards the platonic form, and they will eventually embody the form, eliminating all of their imperfections. And likewise, humans are also evolving towards some sort of perfection. And so when we say that this theory is teleological, and so was the theory of Erasmus Darwin, though for slightly different reasons, but for the most part, you can lump them together here. To be a teleological theory means that they, that they are presupposing that there is a purpose to this process. And for Lamarck, the purpose is this kind of perfection, right? The idea is that there is a goal in mind, and there is actually an end to this process, right? The idea is that evolution kind of just continues uh, in a, in a nonstop but gradual way up until the point where cheetahs or humans have perfected themselves, maximized our full, complete evolution, and then we would stop. And that would be the goal, is to get to that point. This is where we would see, then, that Charles Darwin's theory is vastly different than these other two theories. Uh, first, just a quick little background on how Darwin kind of was inspired with the idea. So as you may know, he was a naturalist, cataloging species. And one of his major uh, trips was uh, along the uh, surveying mission along the coast of South America on a ship called the Beagle, in which he cataloged various species from around South America, uh, and most famously the finches of the Galapagos Islands. And he noted that there were very subtle uh, variations in their beak morphology or beak shape. And he noticed that the, there was a relationship between the, the uh, types of beaks that these finches had and the food sources on those islands, as if they were somehow fit together. And Darwin wasn't even the first to notice that species tend to match their environments. Naturalists for, for centuries at least had, had noticed how uh, specific animals had specific types of, of characteristics that enabled them to, to achieve peculiar and, and particular abilities in, in their uh, unique environments. 
So Darwin's insight into this idea of fitness between the organism and the environment is not in and of itself the complete uh, uh, important part of his, his theory. It wasn't until later, until he returned home and eventually read Thomas Malthus's book on population overgrowth. And what Malthus notes is that populations, animal populations, grow at an exponential rate. You'll, if you start with two uh, members of the population and they have two offspring, you end up with four. And then they have offspring, so you end up with eight. And then 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1,024, on and on with doubling over and over again. And if you were to graph that out, you would see an exponentially increasing curve. As the, as the population will just at some point start rapidly expanding into ever increasing numbers. But the resources of an environment, such as the plant resources that provide food, they do not grow at this exponential rate. They only grow at a linear rate. But if this animal population is lucky, there are still more plants and therefore more food resources to go around then there are animals that need to eat those resources. So there's plenty to go around, and there's no competition for limited resources. And over time, this population of animals will increase, and so will the, the food resources uh, will continue to increase. But at some point, as this population is increasing exponentially, it will begin to outstrip the resources, and there will then begin to be uh, competition for these resources. And this is where Darwin had put these two observations together. He said that what's, what seems likely here is that in an animal population, there will be a, a wide uh, variation in uh, traits. In the case of the finches, the idea is that the original population of finches that came from the mainland of South America would have had a, a wide variation in uh, beak morphology. And as they migrated to the uh, islands of the Galapagos and set up relatively stable and isolated populations with on, um, among those various islands, eventually they began to outstrip the resources and create competition. And then what happened is that only the finches with the specific, uh, just the right beak shape, it, were the ones who were more likely to obtain food and therefore were more likely to live longer and live long enough to have offspring and have more offspring. And so this means then that over time, the population begins to be shaped by uh, this competition. And the ones that have the right kind of beak have more offspring, and therefore the population as a whole begins to, to, ha to have more of that one particular beak shape until over time, all other beak shapes disappear. And all of the animals now begin to look different than birds on, say, one of the other islands. And so now these species begin to diverge. And so this idea of, of speciation through divergence uh, as a function of competition and, and how this is all serving the purpose of maintaining adaptation to the natural environment, this is all part of the crucial uh, insight that Darwin's uh, uh, theory created here that made it so successful. And that's principle of natural selection, and that's about uh, two or three weeks or more of biology class in 10, 10 or 15 minutes or so. So that's just to get us all right on the same page about evolutionary theory. Now let's talk about how these theories, not just Charles Darwin, but some of the others, began to influence psychology. And this comes from this guy, Herbert Spencer. Now it's important to realize that Herbert Spencer uh, was a little earlier than Charles Darwin. So when he gives us what is known as the Spencer-Bain principle, he's draw, drawing perhaps a little more from Lamarck. But what uh, Spencer is noting here is he's, he's accepting the idea of evolution, and he's accepting the idea that uh, evolution has, has equipped us with various traits that are adaptive and help us uh, survive. And he notes that one of the things that, that humans have, and even other animals have, is the ability to learn. And we ha previously have a theory of learning, right? It was back in chapter five, beginning with Locke's theory of ideas and going all the way through James Mill and John Stuart Mill and ultimately Alexander Bain. And it was all about associationism. 
And so Spencer is basically saying, let's take Bain's theories about learning by association and let's couple that with the idea that all of this ability has evolved, right? And that we are now able to su su suggest that uh, learning is not just an evolved trait. So of course, this is couching a, a psychological ability learning in the, in the context of evolution. But that also means it's a biological trait. And that's a pretty important point because now this is moving us away from some of the old fashioned dualism to suggest that our psychological traits are really rooted in our bodies and in particular in our environments. And it's part of our biology. And of course, this also is, it raises um, another uh, implication that is also a rejection of some of the old fashioned dualism the possibility of comparative psychology. Comparative psychology means to, to study animal behavior of one species versus another species and then compare to see what they have in common as if maybe you might be able to generalize. And when it comes to humans, it has long been assumed, especially with Descartes' theory way back in chapter uh, four, that um, human behavior and animal behavior must be fundamentally different in his view. But Spencer Bain principle is suggesting that that's not the case. So just like we can have a comparative biology, a comparative anatomy, we can also have a comparative psychology since learning and other psychological uh, topics are now part of, going to be seen as part of biology. Now there's this other idea. So, so the Spencer Bain principle has, uh, has some basis in, in science, but there's this other idea here that uh, is a bit more controversial and perhaps does not have much of a basis in, in actual scientific evidence. Nowadays, this uh, idea is called social Darwinism, though I want to emphasize that Spencer didn't use that term. It, social Darwinism, I think, was not really used until the mid 20th century. And Spencer here is writing from the mid 19th century. It's also important that, that Spencer's ideas on this topic actually precede the ideas of Charles Darwin. So therefore calling these things, these ideas, social Darwinism is a little bit of a misnomer because they're drawn instead from some of the Lamarckist ideas. And so what, what is he talking about here? Well, if we think back to the example I gave earlier about our intelligence and how our intelligence is supposed to be improving from one generation to the next, and that we would hope to, to get ourselves to that goal of maximizing our humanity by becoming uh, as intelligent as we possibly can be. And Spencer also notes something else, that he notes that not only have humans evolved in their own way, but he notes that a human society has apparently evolved, that we went from be, you know, simple, primitive, perhaps tribal types of society to more organized groups until we get to early forms of government, ultimately to things like monarchy and, and then ultimately to the republic and free, open, democratic societies. And Spencer notes, or makes the argument at least, that uh, the evolution of human intelligence mirrors the evolution of human society as if those two things are importantly linked somehow, so that the more intelligent we become, the, the better we are able to create a society that um, is, is, uh, improves us and uh, is, you know, maximizes human freedom. So this leads to certain uh, conclusions, perhaps, you, you might think, that Spencer noted, that uh, if we want to speed up the process of social evolution to improve human society, to eliminate crime and to eliminate all the sources of evil and things that make us unhappy and cause us suffering, we would want to find a way of speeding up the evolution of human intelligence. This is where the work of Francis Galton comes in. Galton was in fact Charles Darwin's cousin, having the same grandfather Erasmus Darwin but Galton is really much more inspired by Spencer's idea, not his cousin. And so Galton wants, is, wants to essentially prove then that uh, if Spencer is correct, it must be true that our intelligence is inherited. Lamarck is saying that, Spencer is saying that. And so he wants to prove that our intelligence is strictly genetic. So here we see the origins of what we now know as the nature-nurture debate. And to some extent, this mirrors the old rationalism empiricism debate, but it's focused more on specific psychological topics like intelligence.
So Galton, as noted here, was a social Darwinist attempting to prove a strong nature uh, argument for the uh, issue of intelligence. And he writes a book called Hereditary Genius. And in this book, he studied families. And he studied, in particular, people and families who he argued were highly intelligent. And he looked at their children. And he noted that their children also tended to be highly intelligent. But we have to pause for a minute and, and ask, how did Galton measure intelligence in these families? Of course, we might think he administered an IQ test, but there was no such thing as an IQ test in Galton's era. Not yet. We're only just a few years away from that. But Galton did not have IQ tests to use. So he had to come up with other ways of measuring intelligence. And since he's working on the same assumption that Spencer did, that, that human social evolution mirrors our intelligence, then Galton argues that the people who are leading the social evolution, that is the most eminent and successful people, the leaders, presidents and prime ministers, scientists, artists, intellectuals of all sorts, business leaders, successful and wealthy people, industrialists, that all of those people must naturally be intelligent. And therefore, if we can show that the children of all of these very successful, wealthy, and eminent individuals also then grow up to be successful, wealthy, and uh, eminent, that this means that their intelligence was inherited. And it's at this point that we might start to see that there's a real big flaw in Galton's reasoning here, because the fact that the children of highly uh, successful, eminent, and wealthy people grow up to then go uh, to have those same uh, luxuries is not necessarily any proof at all of of a nature part of this debate, but instead it suggests that maybe they have access to uh, opportunities that other people did not and therefore their success could be attributed much more to their nurture than to the nature. So, so Galton, of course, is trying to do all of this stuff to prove the nature side of the debate, but uh, from our perspective, 100 plus years later, we can see that uh, his work was flawed. Now, a few other things to note about Galton here is that uh, one way to speed up the idea of evolution, especially human evolution and social evolution, is that maybe it would be nice if we could get rid of the uh, the people who are dragging us down, the people who lo are low in intelligence. And, and so Galton raised the possibility that we now call eugenics. The idea here could be in a couple of forms. One could just be selective breeding, that if you're, if you're highly intelligent and successful, you should only have children with, from pe with people from another family who are also highly successful and intelligent and so forth, so that your children will also share these traits. And that if you are poor and of low intelligence, then you should only be allowed to have children uh, with other people like you, and therefore your children will continue to carry on just, uh, just like you. And that the division of these social classes would mirror division in intellectual ability, and that that would be a natural state of human affairs, that there should be, in fact, a hierarchy of upper and lower classes. Although there's a stronger version of eugenics, which might involve the forced sterilization of, of these lower social classes, or perhaps even the outright genocide of these lower social classes. And though Galton uh, didn't necessarily advocate such things, we can see that in the 20th century, certain people were in fact highly inspired uh, by these kinds of ideas uh, to, and, and engaged in genocidal practices. So there is certainly a dark side to this kind of social Darwinist thinking, though again, worth pointing out that uh, social Darwinism as a term for all of this stuff is quite a bit of a misnomer. Now, something else about Galton here uh, is that since he believed that intelligence was inherited, he's working on the issue of family resemblance. Right? So when we look at somebody and we see that in their face they resemble their parents, whether it's the shape of their nose or chin or anything like that, we say, okay, this is evidence of family resemblance, and therefore it's an, it's it's uh, resemblance, it, or sorry, it's an it's evidence that these traits, these physical traits, were inherited. And so we look at resemblance in a psychological way by comparing intelligence, as Galton was attempting to do, but 
Galton also believed that if our, if our intelligence is part of our biology, then it should actually correlate with our physical features. And the argument here is that you might be able, and you should be able in Galton's view, to find uh, specific kinds of physical features that are present in the upper class uh, and therefore are uh, indicative of intelligence. And so he wants to prove this. And so he invents an entire field called anthropometry. And this term means measurement of the human body. And so he's in fact engaging in this process of trying to measure people's bodies, right? Not just basic things like height, but the length of your arms and legs, the shape of your face, the aspect ratio of your face, the ratio of the height and width of your face, the length of your nose, the, the width of your chin, and, and the size of your ears, and so on and so forth. All kinds of different measurements to, to, to look for patterns and look to see if any of these particular measurements uh, correlate to uh, success or intelligence or any of that sort of thing. Now, of course, in order to correlate uh, numbers, you need to be able to perform correlational analysis. And in fact, Galton played a hand, had a hand in the invention of correlational analysis. You should hopefully know from your stats classes that it was invented by Carl Pearson. And that's why the correlation coefficient is called Pearson's product movement correlation coefficient. But Pearson was working with Galton and doing this kind of anthropometric research as well as the questionnaire research that, that Galton was, was developing to, um, to, to, to try to measure people's abilities. It's also worth pointing out that Galton also invented word association research. Also, he, he, he felt that uh, intelligence reflected someone's brain efficiency. So when, when I ask you to give me the first word that comes to mind, the idea is that you should be faster at responding uh, if you have a very efficient brain. At least that was his argument. So this idea, as we saw from Galton, that we're trying to measure intelligence in various ways, whether it's physical measurements or whether it's some kind of questionnaire research. And it raises the issue of, can we actually find a way to scientifically measure the mind? And that field is called psychometry. Just like anthrop anthropometry means measurement of the human body, psychometry means measurement of mental constructs, psychological constructs. And in particular, it applies to intelligence testing. Nowadays, psychometry also encompasses personality testing, but we're going to focus still here on intelligence. So if we're going to find a way to try to scientifically measure intelligence, we first have to find a way of scientifically defining intelligence. Certainly, it's a word that we can use in casual everyday language, and we have a sense that we know what we mean when we use the word to say that someone is intelligent or not. But to be more scientific about it, we really need to get a, a grasp on what is actually happening inside the mind of a person that makes them intelligent. So this is a difficult problem, right? Because, well, as we have learned, it's difficult scientifically because if you want to study something scientifically, you need to be able to observe it. And we can't really observe psychological constructs, right? I can't really observe in any direct way someone's intelligence. I can't observe in any direct way someone's personality traits. I can only observe their outward behavior and then attempt to draw inferences about what kinds of intelligence or personality traits might underlie and explain their behavior. This is a, a, a classic problem in doing psychology because as psychologists, we are interested in these psychological constructs that we can't actually measure directly. We can only measure human behavior and then try to infer the constructs behind that. And so this is an issue for positivism, right? Positivism says for, that for something to be scientific, we need to be able to observe it. Uh, and that's also an empiricist issue as well. They you know, observation. Science is, op is about observation. And so, of course, this means then that we can develop a test, which we would call an IQ test ultimately. Uh, but we wonder, you know, to what extent is what we're measuring? Is it really just the score on the test, or are we really trying to use that I that measurement as a as a way of measuring some property of a human being that they actually possess? I have down here in the middle the uh, the classic definition of IQ. This is no longer the, the definition used, and for, for many reasons it uh, is no longer used. So the, I'm going to skip to the next slide very quickly here. Binet, 
is the inventor of the first IQ test. It was called the Binet test. When it was translated into English, it was then called the Stanford Binet test. And that was because it was translated by Lewis Terman, who was a psychology professor at Stanford University. So he began using it there at Stanford, calling it the Stanford Binet test. Now let me go back. Binet first had the idea that the goal of this test should be to measure someone's mental age because he was working with children. He was working with the, the French government and trying to, to uh, improve the, the public education system as they had realized that there were some children with psychological problems that made it difficult for them to learn and function in the regular classroom. And so this is where we get the origins of special education. And Binet's idea is that, it's th that the child's mental age uh, is what you should do to use to, to assign them to a particular grade level. So if we're going to put all the six-year-olds in first grade, then it's not their chronological age, right, that they are literally six years old that we should use as the measurement, but rather we should find a way of calculating their mental age. And if their mental age is six, then they get to go into first grade. And it doesn't matter how old they actually are. So you could be a six-year-old with a mental age of six, and you would go into first grade. But you could also be a 10-year-old with a mental age of six and go into first grade. Or maybe even a four-year-old with a mental age of six and also go into first grade. And what you would learn quickly if you were to actually do that is that these three children, whose chronological ages are four, six, and 10 respectively, but all have the same mental age, these three children are not mentally the same. Right? They have some very significant differences here. And so mental age by itself was not, not enough. And this is where uh, another psychologist named Stern said what you really need to do is look at the ratio, the quotient, between mental age and chronological age, and then multiply that times 100 to get a standard score. So for that six-year-old whose mental age is six, the ratio is one, and then you get uh, 100 as the IQ. And so we would define that as, as being normal. The 10-year-old with a mental age of 6 would end up with an IQ of 60, and therefore that would be considered to be below normal. And a 4-year-old with an IQ of, uh, sorry, uh, with a mental age of 6 would actually have an IQ over 100, so maybe they would be considered gifted and could go into the advanced classes. And so it was in this way that, that Binet began to identify the kids who were in need uh, of special education. It would be the kids who had a low IQ. Historically, the, the cutoff was two standard deviations, which a single standard deviation is 15 points. So we go to an IQ of 70 and say that if you fall below an IQ of 70, uh, then the original word was mental retardation because Binet's claim here is that the rate of development of the child's mind did not match the rate of development of their body. So there was a difference between their mental age and their chronological age, and the mental age was developing slower, and retardation means slowing. Now you might notice that there's a dualism there, right? This possibility that our minds and our bodies don't develop together, and they could be separated in this way, that does reflect an old dualist kind of thinking. And that's one of the main reasons that we have abandoned this, right? We no longer look at children with these, with, who have this low IQ and make any such claim that their mind is developing slowly in relation to their body. That's simply just not the underlying explanation here. There's a variety of other kinds of explanations, many of them genetic, uh, but the key issue here is that we have, we're going to redefine IQ in the 20th century, but this is the original definition of it. Another question we might ask about intelligence is the issue here of does it reflect something that's very specific, such as a specific kind of skill, or is it really some broad um, uh, ability? Right? Uh, so let's think of it this way. Someone could be intelligent, and what that means is that they have just raw intelligence. That means there's just some singular uh, ability that they have, and then the, the, it gives them the ability to master literally anything, right? If they wanted to become a great mathematician, they could do that. If they wanted to become a great philosopher, they could do that. If they wanted to become a great writer, they could do that. The idea is that whatever it is they want to master, they would be able to master it because they just have an ultra high degree of intelligence and that gives them this broad uh, ability to just do anything. 
But it might also be that intelligence is not that, but it's rather a collection of specific kinds of skills. Right? The idea is that we could subdivide our skills into things like verbal ability and spatial ability and logical ability and, uh, and so forth. And we would think that each one of those skills could be independent of all of the others. And that the sum total of all of, the, of our abilities across all of these different domains of skill would represent our total intelligence. And so that becomes one of the challenges when it comes to understanding intelligence is, is it just one kind of thing that, that gives us a, a broad ability to succeed in whatever we put our minds to, or is it really just a bunch of skills? And of course, the nature nurture question still lingers here. We've seen people taking a strong nature approach to it, but what about the other, the nurture side? And this is where we get to Binet. So Binet believed that intelligence was actually uh, a composite of many different skills, which is why I list here that it was a multifaceted set of tests, right? There was lots of different kinds of questions on his tests, measuring different kinds of skills. And therefore he believed in a multi-factor basis of intelligence, right? That intelligence is really several factors all adding together. And he took a pretty strong nurture view and he called it mental orthopedics. And so his idea for you know, even designing special education in the first place was that this should be a situation where you can improve and rehabilitate these children's IQ problems and get them actually caught up, right? You could speed up their mental development was his belief so that you could get them caught up and then after being caught up, they would be able to then be reintroduced to the regular classroom. They wouldn't have to stay in the special ed. So he's equivalent, kind of equating intelligence here to something like a, you know, an athletic or physical skill. And so if you can improve that through practice and training, or just like you might recover from a, an injury through, through uh, rehabilitation, the idea is that we could take that same rehabilitative approach to, to mental problems. And that's what he meant by mental orthopedics. Then we get to Spearman. Spearman's another name you might have heard before in your stats class, because uh, if you are doing correlational research on rank ordered data as opposed to ratio or interval, interval scale data, you have to use Spearman's technique. And so in addition to the Pearson product moment correlation, you have Spearman's rank order correlation. Now Spearman was interested in, so Spearman played a role in developing this, this other statistical technique called factor analysis. And he was interested in using it to understand intelligence tests. So imagine, for example, that you have a, a, an IQ test and it has 100 questions on it. We would think, well, this IQ test has 100 questions, but that doesn't mean it's actually measuring 100 different things, 100 different skills. Some of those questions are probably measuring similar issues, right? So they could, if it's a spatial ability kind of thing, it could be that there are two, three, four, 10 questions that are all measuring spatial ability. And so the idea is that we can look at this 100 item uh, IQ test and say, okay, if we're not actually measuring 100 different underlying intelligence factors, how many are we actually measuring? And this is where Spearman used his factor analysis to, to, to figure this out. So the idea is that if two test items are measuring the same psychological construct, the same aspect of intelligence, then you would expect those test items to be correlated with each other in the sense that when you administer this test to hundreds of, of people, what you'll find is that the people who score high in this ability score high on, that one, on, those, on those test items. And the people who, who score low in this ability will then score low on those same test items. So you're gonna see that there are patterns of intercorrelation, that is item, test items correlating between themselves. And so that's what, what factor analysis lets you do, is it lets you look for patterns of intercorrelated test items to figure out how many underlying factors are really being measured by this 100 question test. And so what Spearman did is that uh, he found that it's really just two factors, and that's why it's called the two-factor theory. He said that there is a general factor that he called G, which represents your general intelligence, Spearman notes, so when I say general intelligence, this is where I'm referring back to the idea of just intelligence as like this broad overarching ability that lets you do basically anything you want. And he noted that it re remains relatively stable across your development and your lifespan. So he considered it to be innate. It was unaffected by learning and opportunity. 
But then there were a bunch of specific skills that he called the ability factor, S, and these are in fact improved through experience and education. So he considered this to be the nurture side. So the two-factor theory addresses the question of nature and nurture by saying it's both. And it also addresses the question of whether intelligence is, is just one singular broad thing or a bunch of, of skills. And again, it's, it's actually both. Now, this more scientific approach to doing intelligence testing didn't necessarily eliminate this tendency of some people to uh, still continue to try to prove the nature debate and therefore keep on searching for a biological explanation of intelligence. So again, we had Galton's work with inter inherited genius, but Galton was only working with families who were highly intelligent, at least his definition of that in terms of wealth and success. So we get to Lewis Term, and I mentioned him before as the, being the translator of Binet's test into English at Stanford University. And Terman was working in the same kind of vein as Galton. He believed that it must be inherited, so he repeats Galton's work, but he uses families that are not just highly intelligent, but also low intelligence, and he's using the Stanford Binet test to measure their intelligence as opposed to using all of the other more unscientific approaches that Galton. So Terman is attempting to take a slightly more scientifically sound approach. And of course, Terman finds correlations here. Parent IQ and child IQ tend to be correlated. Though again, it's important to note that Terman is not proving that, this, that intelligence is inherited because of course, parents do multiple things for their children. They provide them with their genes that equip them with whatever they have, but the parents also provide them with an environment. And so it might be the case that intelligent parents provide good genes for their kids, but they also provide a good environment that fosters their intellectual development. So Terman has not really successfully separated nature-nurture issues, though he's still making the argument for a nature side of this debate. The, fit, the anthropometry stuff continues as well, people trying to make the claim that physical features can be associated with and therefore predict your intelligence. We've talked about phrenology previously, and so this idea that uh, in phrenology that the shape of your skull can be used to predict your ability and your traits, and likewise with craniometry, just the idea that the size of your skull could predict your intelligence. But there's another old idea that is also reminiscent uh, of anthropometry. It's called physiognomy. And the idea with physiognomy is the idea that certain facial features indicate your traits. If you've ever heard of terms like someone having a weak chin, as if having a small chin indicates that they have a weak character, or beady eyes, as if something about the appearance of their eyes causes them to be untrustworthy, then you've heard of physiognomy. And so this idea that someone's facial characteristics somehow indicate their, their underlying psychological characteristics is, is, is part of all of this thinking here. And and so I've got this note that for Goddard and the Kalakak family, and that's coming up, so we'll talk about that in a second, but that's drawing on the same basic idea that someone's appearance may have something to do with their intelligence. It's also worth pointing out that at the University of Pennsylvania, a guy named James McKean Cattell and his student, uh, Whistler, actually performed some actual some tests here. So they, they measured people and they did the anthropometric stuff, and they also tested Galton's idea of brain efficiency by measuring reaction time and even psychophysical thresholds, because if you have an efficient brain, you should have fast reaction times and, and low, low thresholds. And then they administered IQ tests, and they, they looked for correlations between all these things, and they found that there were no correlations. So, of course, this would lead us to believe that these kinds of physical measurements play no role in... Uh, assessing intelligence. But despite Cattell and Whistler's finding, Goddard is about to continue this line of thought. Here I have this old Dilbert cartoon that we can see is uh, just one example in a case of uh, a physiognomy. So that appearance relates to ability somehow. Here's a picture of the Kalakak family. And before I explain what this picture is supposed to represent. Let's talk about Goddard and what he was doing. Goddard was the principal uh, of a school for children who were, had low intelligence, so a special education school. There was one uh, 
girl at the school named Deborah Kalakak. Uh, that was not her family's real last name, uh, but it was a name that Goddard invented to provide some anonymity um, for them, though he s still published photographs of them. Um, but Deborah Kalakak had an extremely low IQ, and in fact, she had the lowest IQ of all of the students at the school. So Goddard was particularly interested in her. And he learned that she was not the only person in her family to have these kinds of issues, that there were several members of her family who had these issues. And so he traveled to meet the family. And as you saw in the previous photograph, those were three children who were part of the Kalakak family line. And as he studied them all, of course, he measured their intelligence and he measured that having a low IQ was a common characteristic of the members of this family. In the 1980s, uh, Stephen Jay Gould argued that um, Goddard had doctored these photographs. So what's unusual about this photograph? It's old and it's grainy, right? And so grainy means low resolution, low contrast. There shouldn't be any dark, heavy lines, right? No clear, well-defined lines between dark and light areas. It all should be fuzzy, gray boundaries. And yet when we look at these children's faces, we see that their eyes and their mouths tend to be very heavily lined, as if their facial features have somehow been accentuated and darkened. And it gives the impression when you look at these pictures that these kids look a little, a little sinister perhaps, right? And that's what Gould was claiming about Goddard's work, that, that Goddard was intentionally trying to make these children look sinister because he wanted to uh, create in the, in the mind of his readers in the book that he wrote about this family, he wanted to create in their minds the, the equivalence between their low intelligence and the possibility that these people are criminals. And this even reflects something that Terman had said. Terman said that intelligence was a necessary uh, claim for morality. Not necessarily sufficient in the sense that you can be intelligent but not necessarily be, um, to be moral. But Terman was claiming that because intelligence is necessary for morality that anyone who was of low enough intelligence they would be incapable of any form of moral reasoning whatsoever. And so between Goddard and Terman, we see there is this tendency to equate the lowest rungs of society in terms of intelligence with the same people who we would associate as the, low, the lower classes, the, 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 the criminals, and everything that we want to eliminate in society. And so here we see the dark side of social Darwinism rearing its head again. Here is the family tree that uh, Goddard uh, came up with, and we see this issue of social Darwinism and eugenics uh, in rearing its ugly head in this in this uh, drawing. So Goddard traced the family tree back to a Revolutionary War officer named Martin Kalakak. And before he married his worthy Quakerist wife, he apparently had an affair with, as it says there, a feeble-minded tavern girl. And she bore a son, and he was apparently pretty horrible and was developed the nickname of being the old horror. And he had lots of children, and then they had lots of children, and so then we end up with Deborah Kalakak somewhere down there amongst all of these faces at the bottom. Notice, of course, that uh, that side of Martin is darkened. It's the dark side. And all of the characters here are drawn with these sinister looking eyes and little devil horns to show that they are not just low, low in intelligence, but they're evil is the implication of this. Meanwhile, of course, um, when, Cal when Martin Kalakak eventually married the worthy Quakeress, of course, she's depicted as being angelic looking, and then they have lots of angelic children and so on and so forth, and lots of good, upstanding, upright people are born from that family tree. That's the light side of the family tree. So, so it seems to be clear that Goddard certainly does, whether he ever truly doctored those photographs or not, Goddard does have this idea that uh, appearance and ability all equate to uh, criminality. And of course, if we're really thinking about this, if we think if there's something about your appearance, 
that predicts your ability, then there's a word for that. And it's racism, right? The idea is that uh, I'm going to say suggest that people with a specific characteristic, a specific physical characteristic, all also have a specific psychological characteristic, such as low intelligence. And so the argument here is that I, I don't need to administer an IQ test to know if you have low intelligence. I can merely look at you. That was Goddard's claim. In fact, Goddard flat out said this because in the 1920s, there were lots of immigrants coming into the United States. So there were immigrants coming in for, for decades, but this was in the, in the uh, decade immediately following World War I. And there were lots of European immigrants coming into the country during this decade. And this is the time when uh, immigrants were forced to go through these booths at Ellis Island, where the Statue of Liberty is. And there were all kinds of tests administered to immigrants. A lot of it was health screening, which makes some sense. But the people were worried that the immigrants that were coming into the country might in some way be bringing us down, might be harmful to the country. Is it possible that they were criminals, perhaps? And so in addition to screening them for health issues, we needed to screen them for criminality. But of course, there's not really a way to screen for criminality. Crime records didn't exist. Uh, but, but Goddard's claim was we should screen them for intelligence. And so he was, in fact, hired as a consultant by the US government to administer intelligence tests to these immigrants. And in particular, Goddard claimed that he didn't need to give them tests. He, sh he would just be able to look at them. But it wasn't practical for Goddard himself to stand there at Ellis Island 24-7 visually examining every single immigrant. So he came up with a, a set of test questions that could be quickly administered by some well-trained assistants, and then they would be able to evaluate the intelligence of all of the various immigrants who were arriving there at Ellis Island. Now, as it turns out, these questions were biased. They were culturally biased to the point that they favored Western Europeans, who, by the way, were more likely to actually speak English than Eastern Europeans. Keep in mind that there was a particularly large amount of immigration coming from Eastern Europe at this time, because Eastern Europe was uh, part of the area in, in Europe that was especially affected by World War I. It began in Eastern Europe, right at the fall of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the the assassination of the Archduke Ferdinand in Serbia and all that sort of stuff. So lots of people coming from that part of the, the, uh, the world. And not only are Eastern Europeans culturally different from Western Europeans and Americans, but they're also ethnically different. And because of differences in facial appearance and other char physical characteristics, this was what Goddard meant when he said that all he needed to do was look at them. And so as it turned out, because of the cultural bias in his tests, um, the people more likely to fail the test were the Eastern Europeans. And so then, of course, when the Congress passed the Immigration Act in 1924 that established quotas for how many people could come into the country from a given part of the world in a given year, it was specifically the Eastern European quotas that were slashed by a very large number suggesting, of course, th that they, they believed Goddard's, Goddard's claims here. And so, of course, we see that there's nothing new under the sun. The issue of immigration and worrying about what it does to society is certainly something that continues uh, to this day, and it has its roots in this kind of social Darwinist thinking that goes back to Spencer, Galton, Terman, and Goddard. And that concludes our Chapter 11 notes.